subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. I'm with Sayyid Akbaruddin, the Dean of the Kautilya School of Public Policy, India's former permanent representative at the United Nations in New York, a former spokesperson of the Government of India across the Manmohan Singh and Narendra Modi governments. And today we're talking about India's presidency, the month of August when India was president of the United Nations Security Council. And of course, several statements on Afghanistan. Uh, Mr. Akbaruddin, welcome to the print. Uh, thank you very much, Jyoti, for having me here. Um, and uh, uh, it's nice to see you on television at least uh, uh, once in a while. Well, uh, we're all at the print trying to do the best we can. But Mr. Agbaruddin, you know the United Nations better than uh, many of you, many of your ilk in the Indian Foreign Service. So explain to me, India's just handed over the presidency from August, when it was president in August, of course, to Ireland this month in September. And during the month of August, a very busy month when Afghanistan came up, uh, several statements in Afghanistan, including a UN Security Council resolution. What is your take on that month? Um, so um, at the UN, generally, uh, August is lean season. Okay. However, uh, things hotted up metaphorically and literally too. Uh, because there were developments in various parts of the world, uh, perhaps most importantly for us in Afghanistan. Uh, so we need to see how the Security Council approached these matters over the period of the month. Uh, there are several meetings. So if you look at it, there was a meeting or a press statement issued on the 3rd of August, another on the 16th of August, a third press statement on the 27th of August, and it was followed by finally a resolution on the 30th of August. Right. In, in between, there was also a meeting on the 6th of August. Mm -hmm. um, it's very interesting to see how things evolved during that period, because if you go back and see, you would realize that the Security Council initially did not feel it was required to engage very much on the subject. Uh, on the 3rd of August, they made a statement saying that they would not countenance the Islamic Emirate to uh, gain power by force. Right. Uh, that element disappeared after the 3rd of August. It's not in any of the other statements. Now, the very fact that you are responding to developments of such a nature only through peace and security uh, only through press statements means that uh, they are not very high in the hierarchy of events. But as events unfolded, they realized that they need to do more. Uh, and that's in a, uh, in a sentence, the Security Council did traverse from the beginning of the month to the end of the month um, in a manner diplomatically where they realized that the gravity of the situation. And uh, as the president of the council, it was also a role played by India to keep on emphasizing on the gravity of the situation. Um, usually presidents have only a facilitating role. It's a rotating presidency for a month, but India did very well, uh, not only in terms of the signature events that they had, but also in steering the security council to a greater focus on issues of uh, global interest which were happening in our neighborhood. Okay, so Mr. Akbaruddin, let me, uh, can I ask you here, you know, you talked about the various press statements that were issued uh, under India's presidency. Now, I see that on the 28th of August, the UN, see, the UN Security Council drops a reference to the Taliban as a terror group. Now, subsequently, we know, of course, that uh, India's ambassador in Qatar has met the Taliban leader, Mr. Stanikzai. But let's walk back to the 28th of August. Were you surprised that India and the rest of the uh, Security Council was coming to terms with the Taliban as a terror, which was a t always considered to be a terror group? And now the Security Council was ready to, to do business with the Taliban. Uh, so you're right. In many ways, diplomacy is the handmaiden of ground realities. Uh, as ground realities change, diplomatic nuances start reflecting those. And that's what happened in this case. Uh, it's a fairly significant change. 
because it's not uh, it's a change by the entire body um, now we need to understand that these statements are consensual in nature that means every country has a right to have uh, a certain element deleted and that's what has happened on, uh, regarding the statement of 27th the statement of 16th had that reference to taliban in the context of other groups um, uh, using uh, uh, afghanistan soil but on 27th they did drop it i understand uh, uh, that it's now fairly widely known that the chinese objected to that reference and it has never come back uh, since then was it was it just the chinese or was it the russians too no that specific reference was a chinese effort that they objected to that the russians had other areas of interest in the ultimate resolution uh, but uh, uh, on the 27th it was the chinese who felt strongly uh, that uh, that reference which had uh, been reflected in 16th was not there now as president you can either have a statement or you can't have a statement um, depending on if a permanent member certainly uh, doesn't want it there so uh, we need to take that into account as we see the evolving situation today which are the most powerful nations would you say well the security council is a hierarchical body there are five who are bestowed with veto What's rights the permanent five who do you think today after the in the wake of the afghanistan um, you know the, the taliban coming to power in afghanistan who would you say has asserted himself more amongst the p5 so um, i think we need to step back and see it slightly differently and let me try and explain why uh, the us unilaterally is decided that it would not play the role of a global security manager anymore right it's a choice that they made it's a choice that was made quite some time ago they went about it in a rather slow manner over a period of time etc now if somebody steps back uh, from a role that they were taking for uh, everybody took for granted in the world obviously Uh, there are implications of that uh, those uh, reverberations are still not yet fully assessed uh, sure uh, the chinese and the russians did make out a um, public pitch that they put out a public pitch that it has shown the limits of intervention it is showing usa in in retreat etc etc and that's a fair public a posture to adopt from those who did not want us presence in, in their uh, vicinity and that's understandable okay. but that said now that the us has moved out somebody else has to address this issue because as we know ungoverned spaces provide opportunities for unsavory elements to hatch would the russians move in i have certainly think no they've had Uh, a difficult experience themselves in afghanistan would the chinese want to do this again it's not going to be an easy choice for them there is a debate going on within china itself about whether they should step up or not in terms of security because everything else follows stability and security so you still have a dilemma there is you have a uh, self uh, appointed role of a um, um Uh, of the us uh, wanting to step back nobody today is willing to step in um, so there lies the difficulty and the dilemma for all of us so let me ask you about india now india is president a non permanent member of course of the security council but there were reports that the united nations secretary general mr antonio guterres did not invite india as the president of the security council last month in august to an informal uh, discussion that he had had with the other p5 members now what does that mean why would you not do that so um uh the united nations in new york is a hierarchical structure uh and at this given stage uh, in terms of the hierarchy the p5 stand way above everybody else however important other countries may be 
however uh, their uh, economic or political stature may be the p5 reigns supreme i don't think it's a good uh, uh, situation uh, because the world has changed uh, since uh, the system came into being but uh, in legal terms that's how it operates uh, and so there is not invite india pardon why would mr guterres not invite india as the president of the council that month to a meeting that he is hosting uh, holding with the p5 on afghanistan so the p5 are way above presidencies fine uh, right um uh, in the pantheon if you have the 15 to be divided they would be the p5 above everything else okay then they would be the president and then they would be the rest for that month uh -huh. uh, so uh, he invited the first layer i don't think we need to worry too much about it uh it of course reflects his thinking uh, also his approach has been to focus on humanitarian aspects this is not an area yeah, this is not an area that india generally has taken the lead in terms of humanitarian aspects so mean, that therefore that does this mean that at least at the united nations if you're not a permanent member of the security council you actually don't really matter especially in a case like afghanistan i mean and this is just one example of course um well let me put it another way security council permanent members matter most other members to matter uh, because technically nine people if you get a vote you can get it through yes the the, the permanent members can veto but veto is not an easy decision when you see a large number of people uh, wanting to vote for the other side so generally unless your extreme core interests are involved you don't generally veto for example look at the uk and france it's 30 years since they used their veto because they realize that many areas they are not their core interests uh, they have other bigger fish to fry so they are working on that rather than uh, on the veto so let's keep that in mind that numbers do matter the permanent members have a status we are not happy with it uh we want change but that change is not going to happen easily okay so again there are uh, you know there's a lot of analysis reports a comment commentary in uh, the indian media which say that the that india has uh, allied itself a little bit too closely with the americans and that therefore your position on afghanistan was not as independent perhaps as it should have been say for example you could have been much more um open to the outreach of the russians or the chinese these are the taliban we were meeting the taliban what would you say to that so um i think we need to start uh, at the beginning uh, uh, and that relates to india's approach to afghanistan and taliban mm -hmm. unlike the chinese or the russians uh, our approach has been um if i may say so uh slightly different uh from even when the us was supportive of the taliban in its first phase uh, we felt that these were militant terrorist organizations and that predates uh, the us engagement with the the taliban and i remember times when we would say this others would say no no this is not a terrorist organization these are only uh we need to look at them uh, through the prism of uh, local uh, uh policing etc and all who, so who, india who said this who is it pardon which country do you remember saying this uh, well i don't want to say which country but it's available on record for example that the us was supporting uh, a, a regime in the 1990s um, which wanted uh, would assist in a pipeline where they had economic interest so it's not new uh, with that uh, also so we need to just understand india had a distinctive position in in terms of addressing militancy fundamentalism in uh, afghanistan and towards the taliban it was uh, much more uh, hardline than any of the others so now if the others are moving towards engagement of some sort obviously it's normal that we would be more reticent because the space we are coming from uh, it's a different space now the other thing that we need to uh, remember is unlike the us or russia 
or China, uh, our uh, way of looking at the Taliban is also through the prism of their engagement with Pakistan. Right. Uh, so uh, the Pakistan is not inimical to any of the other three countries, uh, US, uh, Russia or China, but its approach to us is clearly at a different level. So we need to be more cautious and that's what we've done. Now, if your argument is uh, we should engage uh, in, um, uh, in view of the new realities, I think that will happen. Uh, engagement is what diplomats do. Uh, and so uh, engagement perhaps is necessary and it will go down that path. But engagement doesn't translate immediately into uh, recognition. There is a long bridge to cover between engagement and recognition. So, Mr. Agurajit, explain to me, how do you look at this for India? Do you think this is a setback for India? Uh, do you think it's a gain for Pakistan? I'm talking about the, the Afghanistan question. Uh, certainly. Uh, I think there are no two uh, questions about it. This is a setback for India um, and a gain for Pakistan. Um, India today is in a difficult position strategically because Pakistan's strategic goals have uh, been um, have uh, expanded and are very near fusion. They've, uh, whereas ours uh, of uh, having a development oriented approach uh, are, uh, have not uh, yielded the results that we would have wanted after so much of investment. Uh, that said, uh, the situation is such that we don't know what the uh, multiple reverberations would be. Uh, certainly from a security aspect, it would be a difficult situation for us. Um, also, uh, Afghanistan, we have no exit policy from Afghanistan because it's a neighborhood. You don't exit from your own neighborhood. So what will it will mean in terms of terrorism, what it will mean in terms of instability, drugs, uh, trafficking, um, a rise of uh, providing space for militant groups, unsavory characters, all these are issues which have now come on the table for us in a manner which haven't been there for at least two decades uh, since the disappearance of Taliban 1.0. So in a nutshell, yes, these are difficult times for us, perhaps times uh, more difficult than we can recollect any others in recent memory in terms of India-Afghanistan ties. So a, a couple more uh, you know, related questions. Now, how do you look at the way Pakistan has moved in to Afghanistan? It, it, its, its ambassador is there. Of course, India has withdrawn its ambassador. Now we've seen these new, uh, this, this meeting with the Mr. Sanikzai, the Taliban leader. But if you look at Pakistan, it's good relations with China on the one hand and improving relations with Russia. Do you find that interesting? So we acknowledge that the world is in flux. And so everybody is looking for new partnerships, uh, strengthening old ones, uh, reaching out to others, etc. Pakistan invested in a uh, group um, over the years, uh, which was considered an international pariah. That group now has uh, the momentum to uh, be in the lead in terms of um, uh, uh, holding uh, authority and power in uh, Afghanistan. And our approach, which was different, uh, didn't seem to succeed. So yes, um, but uh, yes, the, uh, Pakistan has uh, uh, gained in this uh, sequence of events. But India has other uh, equities which we need to leverage, as you yourself said, about initial engagement uh, with the Taliban at a very uh, incipient level. Uh, but it's going to be a long road for India. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, things uh, of this nature and the implications will take years, if not more, to fully comprehend and move, uh, move ahead. So I don't think we should now uh, rush in, uh, in the circumstances that uh, we find ourselves in. It is better to recalibrate. Uh, that uh, issue is already on the table. As you notice, the external affairs minister and the national security advisor are now on a committee to address what are, um, um, what is this uh, evolving situation. And 
uh, we need to take a longer term approach rather than uh, just uh, make uh, immediate decisions. Uh. Right. With Russia, would you say that India's relationship with Russia has gone through, you know, in recent times, especially gone through more troughs than heights? And as and do you feel that Russia's sort of improved relationship with Pakistan? How do you look at the two? And in your time at the Security Council, when you were India's permanent representative, give us a flavor of the India-Russia um, at the time, the relationship. So India and Russia have a, at the strategic level, the ties are excellent. Uh, at the bilateral level, the ties are very good. However, translating these into ties at the multilateral uh, bodies is a, always a difficult task with all countries because each pursues their interests. Now, Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council. By definition, it will have different interests uh, as permanent member compared to non-permanent members. But uh, my experience has been that where possible, they have been helpful. Uh, I remember the case of when we were contesting the ICJ election against a fellow permanent member of the, of the Russians, that was the UK. Uh, now, at a bilateral level, there is a slam dunk for us because our ties with Russia far exceed the ties that Russia has with the UK. Uh, that said, they are all, both permanent members, so they always have a vested interest in being supportive of each other. Despite that, the Russians among the P5 were amongst the most accommodated accommodative of our interests. So uh, I think they are very nuanced. They are a country with a tradition and an understanding of history. Uh, it is in our interest to nurture those ties uh, and to continue to um, foster them because uh, such ties are built over decades uh, and we should not uh, uh, allow them to wither away because it has been a tested partner in the past. Uh, it remains a strategic ally and we need to continue to um, uh, build on, on those despite having differences. Every state has differences on some issue or the other and I don't think those differences have in any way fundamentally altered the strategic convergence between Russia and India. But perhaps it has, Mr. Akbaruddin. For example, I know that there is some bitterness in New Delhi about the very close um, a, a alliance, if you like, between Russia and China. So um, let's go back in, the, in history. Uh, Russia always considered China as the most important country in Asia. This is not even now. This is under the communists too. Even when they had their differences with China, uh, when they were allies, it was a different ball game altogether. But even when they had the differences, they considered China as a um, uh, key uh, in terms of their interests in Asia. China was number one. And that remains so. It's now a 50 year horizon that you can look at it. They have been consistent even when they had their differences uh, with the Chinese. Today, um, if you look at it, uh, they see themselves as a fit because of what was happening with the rest of the world. Uh, uh, Europe and the US uh, were uh, in partnership to try and isolate Russia. Uh, that tactically uh, did not uh, uh, help uh, in doing anything but to um, push Russia into a closer and closer relationship with the Chinese. Um, because if there is a triangular relationship, two will need to be uh, um, have a closer relationship than the third. And that's what's happened between Russia and China. Uh, so by definition, uh, Russian interests with China will always exceed our interests. And this is, uh, honestly, we need to look at it this way. Even in the Security Council, the Chinese and the Russians uh, will need each other much more, can be helpful to each other much more than we can. But that doesn't mean to say that um, uh, we uh, give up our ties. Uh, in times of crisis, uh, it's useful to uh, still have relationship which can in some way, nudge, um, rather than have uh, a relationship uh, which uh, uh, goes insipid. I don't think that's ever thought of. Uh, India will remain 
for uh, for for india russia will remain a key strategic partner irrespective of in their equation where we fit we haven't slipped down in their equation others have risen because they were already at a high pedestal and they've gone further right so do you feel that india is losing or lost perhaps a little bit even its ability to play all sides or different sides um so um you're right in terms of uh, flexibility uh, there will be situations uh, where you may not find that flexibility which was there previously uh, but you need to see why is that happening because your needs are such a uh, foreign policy is only an adjunct of what your domestic needs and requirements are if you want to plug into the global economy if you want global investment if you want technology all these are factors which come from a uh, uh, um, balance of countries uh, there aren't others who are willing to provide you all these on par with this given the approach we have which is a private sector driven approach etc etc so our needs inevitably will push us into a engagement in multiplicity of uh, uh with the multiplicity of stakeholders in uh, with countries who have this and uh there is a price to pay in other terms for that you gain in in technological terms in economic commercial terms of that flexibility you lose something in political terms for that flexibility it's a it's a call you have to take on each issue there are no set guidelines for this So the short question India has lost its ability to play all sides at the same time. Uh, in the world everybody has lost this. The Taliban is clearly seeking international legitimacy especially at the UN. An accreditation meeting is coming up uh, in the middle of September. India is of course not part of that committee. Having said that, do you think that in the wake of what you've seen in the last few weeks, do you think that that the accreditation committee will grant accreditation or legitimacy to the taliban uh, so jyoti there are many things happening at the un and let me try and dissect for you each of these things uh, number one is the entire un mission in afghanistan needs to be renewed annually uh, that has to be done before the 15th of september it's done to the security council right uh now of course they will work out some via media and not bothered about the issue of uh, the mission continuing it will continue in some form or the other uh, because there are humanitarian needs there are uh, uh, needs of development assistance apart from the political and other requirements so that will continue that said the issue that you need to watch is will the present permanent representative of afghanistan who was speaking on behalf of afghanistan till august 6th will he be permitted to speak at the time of the renewal mm -hmm. uh, he uh, if you notice uh, on uh, 30th of august only the council members spoke right. now in terms of the unama uh, uh, renewal it's traditional for the the country concerned to speak because they are the host to that mission sure. uh, that's the first signal you will see after 16th whether things are changing uh, the permanent representative did speak on the 16th but then it was still in flux since then um, things a lot of things have happened so that's the first signal before even the credentials because then you will perhaps acknowledge as in the case of uh, the myanmar uh, government that the present permanent representative who actually represents uh, dao on song suu kyi uh, is uh, no longer represent uh, is still the permanent representative although the government has changed right. and he is speaking uh, quite openly against the present establishment and yet he continues so we will see whether this happens this is number 1 the first signal that we can look at the second signal that we can look at is the taliban sanctions committee of which india is the uh, chair right. now all decisions in these committees are by consensus mm -hmm. so any one country can stand up and say that no we don't want a continuation mm -hmm. uh, it's virtually like a veto you are aware 
of the great difficulties we had in getting these committees to uh, list or designate Masood Azhar as a, a terrorist uh, individual. It took us 10 years because it was consensus of everybody. We will see whether uh, those who are supportive of a greater role for the Taliban are able to swing that through. So that's the second uh, uh, marker. This will come around 21st or so before the 22nd of September. And the third marker that you've said is the Credentials Committee. Now, that is not a Security Council body. It's a body of the General Assembly, which consists of nine countries. Two of the, three of them are permanent members, US, um, Russia and China, and six will be nominated by the President of the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, they will take a decision on the credentials. Of course, there are a multiplicity of options there and we can go down if you want, but I leave it at that, that there are several markers coming up. So if August was hot for Afghanistan, September doesn't seem to be cooler. If you're not a member of the Permanent Five, then you may as well not be in the UN at all. I mean, how does it matter for me as, you know, okay, India is a large country in the developing sphere, in developing world, but the, the Americans are cutting a deal with the Taliban in Doha. They decided to invade Iraq in 2003, irrespective of the United Nations Security Council. The Chinese are, are saying what they want. They refuse to um, uh, you know, go along with the resolution on the Taliban. So the P5 is running the world. Why should, why should India care about the UN at all, or the UN Security Council? The system is not uh, functional because actors have changed. Actors' interests have changed. So. Uh, multilateralism or the United Nations is not a god that failed. It's an instrument uh, that uh, should lead us towards a better uh, ability to cooperate. If we do not have that ability, perhaps we should look at other ways of developing that ability. Uh, after World War I, uh, World War II has changed. That differential is not so much purely in economic terms, but also in other terms. Um, so once that differential is changing and also the US as a matter of choice wants to retreat from its uh, role as a global security manager, uh, it will be a flux. But uh, we've seen situations like this happen previously. Uh, uh, people who have written on this historically will uh, vouch for it that such situations are not linear in the way they develop. So I don't want to make that guess, but yes, uh, changes in the air, reverberations are uh, can be noticed all through. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, we are in for times of flux and uh, it's not the right time to make guesses, even if they are educated ones. Well spoken like a true blue diplomat, Mr. Akbaruddin, refusing to look into the crystal ball or the Seta Bazaar, uh, shall I say. But this is the God you argue, which has not failed. We shall watch this space over the next few weeks and months. Thank you so much for speaking to the print. Thank you very much, Jyoti.